we have been joined by uh, Tarun Singh, who is the uh, creator of the spectacular 3D model of the Kohinoor uh, that we were able to see today. And uh, he is uh, uh, also creating a number of these models. I have a question to ask uh, Tarun. So Tarun, welcome to the show. Hi, Sonia. Thanks for having me. Very nice. Uh, just the spectacular uh, models that you have created. Amazing work. And one of the things I'd like to know is, uh, what is the process by which you create uh, these uh, stunning models? Can you just walk us through right from, you know, how do you start and, and how it ends up to this uh, wonderful image? Of course, yeah. First, what we do is we start to research the object and collect as much information about the object as we can, studying the design and the physical makeup, uh, the type of materials. And we also look at the damage and wear and tear of the object as well to try and recreate that and, and, and preserve that. Uh, once we understand the object, we start to build a 3D model using computer aided design software. Uh, and once we have a 3D model, we start to unwrap and add color and physical material properties so that the object will respond to a light environment as a real object would. Once we have a, that a kind of a, a object ready, we can then insert it into a game engine or an online WebGL engine, which means that people can look at it and manipulate it in real time. And we've even been able to put these objects into virtual reality headsets as well. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, for, for the Kohinoor that we saw, uh, mm -hmm. how many images do you need to click to, to create something like this? So with the Kohinoor, we only had like a few images and some drawings as well. So some of it, we actually have to take a bit of artistic license and make it up from photographs. So for example, um, you know, we only had kind of minimal photographs. So there was a lot of kind of manual work in terms of recreating the material textures and, and colors. So the, so the depth, if you see the width of the piece, is that something then you have to work in into, into the design? Yeah, so we kind of used, like we said, we did the research. So we look at the kind of uh, documentation descriptions that people have given. And also we try and get in touch with the museums as well to see if we can get access to the objects. So sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. But if we can't, we will use whatever information we have. And sometimes we just kind of um, kind of use our own kind of artistic eye to, to kind of um, create the object. So... Uh... What are the next upcoming models that uh, we should look out for that you're working on? Yeah, so we've got um, some really nice items from the uh, Royal Armouries in Leeds. So we've got three items coming from there. And we've also got three items, including um, the Thals, which uh, Rav showed you earlier. Uh, we've got a 3D model of that. And we're hoping to be able to put that into a virtual reality environment where you can actually pick it up and, and start to hear it and listen to it or try to play it. So as well as being able to see the objects, we want people to be able to, especially children, to be able to engage with the objects, hold them, pick them up and, and kind of manipulate them in their hands. So already within our current VR experience, you can actually uh, click on the object and hold the swords and the different shields in your hands, as well as the jewelry as well. Wonderful. So uh, as, as a creator, you started with these uh, objects. Uh, but what is the future potential that you see to use this technology for the preservation and the conservation of our arts or maybe our architectural material heritage uh, books? So it, it, it are, could you share a bit of that? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, there's so many applications uh, that will be coming. So one of the applications that we've been looking at is 3D printing. So the ability to be able to create replicas of objects. Um, and also, once you have a digital virtual object, it means that you don't have to transport the, the, the object, you don't have to insure the object, so it means that uh, you could make infinite copies and everyone around the world can experience the same object um, without having all that kind of um, you, you know, the cost involved with uh, creating exhibitions. Um, so once we have a virtual object, it's preserved. So in future, if, if we do ever lose these objects or we don't have access to them, um, you know, people can still show them to their children, which I think is one of the main reasons that drove me to start to create these 3D models, because there were so many objects, beautiful objects from my history, which we didn't have access to. 
and I thought it was a shame, you know, that I wouldn't be able to show my children these objects. So being able to create them in 3D and be able to see them in front of you in a VR environment is probably the next best thing from actually being there at the museum. You can't replace the museum, but it, it's it's the next best experience that we can we can have. So it's so you get feedback from your kids when you create uh, the pieces. <laughs> yeah, I do. I always kind of get them to have a look at it when we did the augmented reality exhibition where you can actually hold a card and you can see the object in front of you. Um, we, we try to add a bit of playfulness to the experience uh, so that children can have a bit of fun. And then afterwards, we can have a conversation with them. Oh, look, what, which sword did you hold or which piece of jewelry? And then we've even been able to 3D print some of these objects. And like we did uh, from the Victorian Albert Museum, we had arrows that we were able to 3D print and give these to the children because they were non-sharp and be able to look at the design of them so they could draw or start to paint them. And uh, because it was relatively cheap to 3D print, we could give them away as little souvenirs that they could take away with them. That's mm -hmm. fabulous. I think those are amazing uh, possibilities and potential. And it's good because the, the, the younger generation is the future. And uh, what you're doing, we really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see more and more of your work. So I would like you, all of you to visit uh, their website, uh, which is, um, can you say the name of the website, uh, Tarun? Yeah, it's the angloseekmuseum.com. Great. Thank you very much, Tarun. It was a pleasure to speak with you today. And uh, also thank you for your help with this show. Uh, you have been uh, just absolutely awesome uh, helping us out, just getting this whole set up. And I'd also like to thank uh, Tanit Gujral, uh, the program director of the Sikh Foundation for bringing all of this together. And also Sukhamrit Singh and Rajinder Singh who have created the app, which I talked about earlier, uh, the Sikh Foundation International app uh, for the Sikh Foundation. And all these images that we shared with you are available on the app, uh, which you can enjoy uh, at your leisure.